I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States the office of President of the United States January 1977 Jimmy Carter takes the oath as President of the United States promising a new beginning after the trials of Watergate and Richard Nixon's resignation the Constitution of the United States so help me God so help me God congratulations but the Cold War still rages as President Brezhnev reviews his forces in Red Square. In Britain, summer crowds as the country celebrates the Queen's Silver Jubilee. Her Majesty goes walkabout, almost mobbed by her adoring subjects. But in New York in July, crowds of a different sort as newsmen mob a police car outside the 84th Precinct Station House. The reason? The capture of a suspect who seems to be one of the most bizarre killers ever to terrorize the city. The story had centered not on the island of Manhattan, the most famous, but the smallest of the city's five boroughs, but across the east in the other four, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx, where most of the population lives. It was in these neat, ordered suburbs that a man first labeled the .44 caliber killer, and then the son of Sam created a year of terror. While the South Bronx has become infamous as a hotbed of crime, further north are quieter areas where law-abiding citizens, many of them of Italian extraction, sit on their stoops and gossip the summer nights away. At one o'clock in the morning of July the 29th, 1976, two teenagers, Donna Loria and Jody Valenti, were chatting in a car saying goodnight. As she half opened the door to get out, Donna was confronted by a man who pulled out a gun. A bullet hit her in the neck. Another smashed Jody's thigh. By the time Donna reached hospital, she was dead. Jody described their attacker as male, about 30, with curly black hair. Twelve weeks later, there was another shooting in the usually quiet Flushing neighborhood of Queens. A couple were sitting in a parked car when a gunman fired on them. One shot hit and severely injured the long-haired male passenger who looked like a woman from behind. Only a month later, also in Queens, two more teenage girls were injured in a shooting. In both cases, the victims were certain that their gunman had long, fair hair, so the police did not make any connection with the Donna Loria killing. The next shooting in Queens on the 30th of January, 1977, killed 26-year-old Christine Freund. She had been to see the film Rocky with her boyfriend, and they were sitting in his car around midnight when shots blasted through the passenger window. Later, her boyfriend gave public voice to the suspicion that the shootings were connected and that a killer with a particular target was on the prowl. Uh, this man's got to be caught because he will injure or kill a lot more people if he's not caught in, you know, in a certain amount of time because he's, I think he's a... Uh, Sick is a word, it's just an excuse for him. And everybody says he's sick or something like that. I don't believe in that. He's uh, a man that I think is only out to kill and, and, and injure couples because maybe he's an ugly guy. Maybe he's uh, some kind of a freak that is, uh, can't see couples together. Or himself he got turned out by a woman, you know, and he can't handle the situation. The police had now realized that all the shootings had been carried out with the same gun, a .44 caliber bulldog pistol, heavy and inaccurate, but with lethal power at short range. And uh, he's, uh, he's very good with a gun. Reluctant to start a panic, the police had avoided a public announcement, but they were forced to break their silence after a press conference on the 10th of March, 1977, when police commissioner Mike Codd alerted the city. Well, we, we think just a common sense approach would be in reading the newspapers and in seeing the coverage that this is getting on television, that any young girl and fella 
would not park for any great length of time in an automobile in any desperate location, especially dark locations, and especially late in the evening. What had forced their hand was another fatal shooting, the third by the 44 caliber killer, as he was now being called. Virginia Voskaritschian was returning to her home in Exeter Street, Queens, on the 8th of March, 1977. She stepped aside to let a young man pass, but he pulled out a gun and shot her dead. The bullets came from the same gun as the other shootings. Only five weeks later, on the 17th of April, 1977, the same weapon was used to kill courting couple Valentina Suriani and Alexander Esau as they sat in a car in the North Bronx, close to where Donna Loria had been murdered. But this time the killer had left another clue. When the police arrived, they found a letter in the middle of the road addressed to Captain Joe Borelli. Despite bad spelling, it ended clearly enough. I'll be back. I'll be back. Bang, 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 bang. Uh, yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Earlier, the writer had said, I feel like an outsider. I am on a different wavelength than everybody else, programmed to kill. I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. I am the son of Sam. And it was this name that caught the public imagination as New York became obsessed by the killings. Son of Sam sent a second letter, this time to newspaper columnist Jimmy Breslin, starting off, Hello from the gutters of New York City, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine and blood. The letter threatened ominously, Sam's a thirsty lad. He won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. Tragically, within a month, on the 26th of June 1977, Sam got more blood as Judy Placido and Salvatore Lupo were shot at point-blank range as they sat in Sal's car after an evening at a discotheque in Queens. Incredibly, they both survived, and witnesses spotted a stocky man running away. The police now had several descriptions of the killer, but they were confused because some spoke of a man with long, fair hair, while others described him as having curly, dark hair. The one consistent link between all the shootings was the weapon, the same .44 caliber bulldog. The police began to believe that either there must be two linked killers or a dark-haired killer was wearing a blonde wig. This was the basis for their photo fit pictures. The net was closing in, but not before the son of Sam claimed one more couple as victims. Stacy Moskowitz and Bobby Violante were on their first date. They went to a movie, New York, New York, and a meal. Then they settled down for a quiet cuddle at 1.45 a.m. in Bobby's car under a street lamp on Shore Parkway near Coney Island Fairground. Son of Sam watched them kiss and opened fire. Stacy was shot in the head and died next day. Bobby was shot in the face and blinded. One local resident spoke of the general feeling of disbelief. I, I don't know if I would have felt per perfectly safe, but just like the people who were parked there, I think now maybe I would have laughed about it or something and said, wow, maybe the 44 caliber killer is going to come here, but I never would have really believed it. Tragically, Stacy Moskowitz and her sister had jokingly put the odds on meeting the 44 caliber killer at several million to one. Now her family could only mourn their loss as the son of Sam claimed what turned out to be his final victim. Malcolm's <laughs> For there had been several witnesses to her killing, and one of them turned out to have the vital clue. For three days, Mrs. Cecilia Davis remained silent for fear of retribution from Son of Sam. Then she came forward to say that at 2 a.m. on the night of the killing, 
she had seen a yellow Ford Galaxy illegally parked by a fire hydrant. A young man had taken a parking ticket off it and driven away. When the police checked the ticket, it had been given to a David Berkowitz who lived in Yonkers. Two detectives went to his address and found the yellow Ford Galaxy parked outside his apartment. Looking through the window, they saw the butt of a rifle sticking out of a duffel bag. They opened the car and then found a letter addressed to the police commissioner written in Son of Sam's unmistakable handwriting. It threatened a shooting attack on Long Island. I think we've got him, said Detective Ed Zigo, as the car and apartment were staked out. Six hours later, a plump, dark-haired young man came out and got into the car. The police raced forward and told him to freeze. The young man gave them a beaming smile. When asked who he was, he simply said, I'm Sam. He made no attempt to resist arrest and was taken back to the local precinct house while the news that the son of Sam had been captured spread like wildfire. Under questioning, David Berkowitz confessed cheerfully to all the son of Sam killings and to being the author of the letters. He was so obliging and forthcoming that the initial questioning only took half an hour. After 12 months, the police team had their man, and the detectives who arrested him were soon talking to the press. Detective Charles Higgins and John Wongo were staked out on a roof to cover the back and the roof. And at that point, we observed a male coming out of the apartment house. We watched him go to the car, and when he got into the car and started the engine, we took him into custody. Berkowitz's apartment was searched and a cache of arms discovered and removed. Then the press moved in and his neighbors were able to give vent to their feelings of amazement and shock at having lived so close to Son of Sam. Um, what I found it pretty scary was that, you know, him living so close and, like, you know, he was really nice to us. Everybody was complaining about he's being, you know, so bad and everything. And, you know, like, he was really nice to us, so, you know, he, we really never had any problems with him. I'm shocked to hear it was him because I don't, I would never have thought it was. Mayor A. Beam was swift to thank the police. I want to say that all New Yorkers, hearts and thanks, go out to this crack professional police team that resolved this very baffling case, which was like looking for a needle in a haystack. And all New Yorkers, I'm sure, expressed their thanks to the police, their families, the volunteers, and retired detectives, all of whom pitched in. At his initial questioning, David Berkowitz had told the police an incredible story. He had been urged to kill by demon voices, which had accompanied him when he went hunting for victims and told him what to do. He claimed that the demon voices told him that they originated from his neighbor, Sam Carr, and that orders to kill had been transmitted to him by Carr's dog. Berkowitz's flat overlooked the Carr's house, and on investigation, the story became even more bizarre. Berkowitz had never met Carr, but he had written letters complaining about the howling of his dog, a black Labrador. The press swiftly descended on the family of the innocent man whom son of Sam claimed was his infernal father, but they got little satisfaction. any and all information and I understand they'll be issuing a statement. You can contact the Chief's Office 963-4900. Can we talk to Mr. Carr? No. Mr. Carr has been asked not to talk to the press and we're not making any comments, okay? Speculation was fueled by the revelation that the Carr's house had been firebombed and their black Labrador shot. Berkowitz admitted both crimes and claimed that the fact that the dog survived showed that it was a devil in disguise. Born on the 1st of June, 1953, 
David Berkowitz was the unwanted result of a liaison between his mother and a married businessman. He was adopted as a newborn baby by Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz. It was a traumatic shock when Pearl died of cancer when he was 13. Even worse was the betrayal he felt when Nathan married again in 1971. Berkowitz resented his new stepmother and stepsister and soon left his father's home. He joined the army and served in Korea, where he experimented with drugs. On leaving the army, he returned to New York in 1974 and ended up working for the Postal Service. Within hours of his arrest, Berkowitz was arraigned for the Son of Sam murders. He still smiled as cheerfully as he had during his arrest. Two lawyers announced that some of his relatives had asked them to prepare his defense. And the judge ordered that he be committed to Kings County Hospital for psychiatric examination. In hospital, he talked about how he had been driven to kill by demonic voices. Psychiatrists noted his sense of inadequacy and sexual frustration. Many people were surprised at the massive security which surrounded him. The uh, hospital grounds were closed to everybody, including, as you know yourself, the press. And uh, there were people stationed on the rooftops, and uh, he was taken in a closed van with a motorcycle convoy. And the uh, major case squad of the New York Detective Division uh, was in charge of the whole escort. Why was it so tight? Well, obviously, uh, uh, this man is uh, killed or shot 13 people, killed six. And there's always a chance that he may try to get away or somebody in the city uh, would try to uh, take out a personal uh, vengeance against the man. He has to be safeguarded. He ha he's entitled to his civil rights. His constitutional rights have to be protected. He's entitled to a trial, and that's what we have to see that he gets. Meanwhile, the police department displayed some of the weaponry which had been discovered in his apartment, together with a folder of poems in Son of Sam's handwriting. Pride of place was given to the 44 caliber pistol which had been discovered in his car and identified as the gun used in the killings. It now emerged that in addition to the cars, Berkowitz had written other anonymous letters. Two had been sent to a police officer, Craig Glassman, who lived in his apartment block. On July 13th, a second letter was received by, you. by myself through the mail, and again it was the same person who had written the first letter, except in the second letter it was referred to as like my superior Craig Glassman, and then this next line was Sergeant Glassman. So this led me to believe that it must have been somebody who had seen me in uniform, and uh, at that time... Okay. Can you read us on Yes, I will. My master, Craig, you will be punished. Craig, how dare you force me into the night to do your bidding? I promise you, Craig, that the world shall spin on you and your mother. New paragraph. I know, Master, that I am doomed, but do not think that I will not tell the authorities of you. True? I am the killer, but Craig, the killings are on your com are on your commands. I'll repeat that again. True, I am the killer, but Craig. The killings are your commands. <clears throat> I shall see you standing naked at the judgment seat. Upon your condemnation, the world shall rise in jubilation. The terrible, wicked Craig is dead. They shall shout. How well did you know? The streets have been filled with blood, Glassman, per your request, and signed your brother. Berkowitz had narrow escapes. After he killed Virginia Voskarichian, he was stopped at a police roadblock. His 44 was on the seat beside him. But just before it was his turn, the car-to-car -car search was called off. It also proved that one of the photo fits did have a striking resemblance apart from the confusion over hair color. Two weeks after his arrest, Son of Sam was taken to court for formal proceedings to begin. Two psychiatrists had now concluded that he was suffering from advanced paranoid schizophrenia. 
To counter this, the King's County District Attorney produced a forensic psychiatrist's opinion that while the defendant shows paranoid traits, they do not interfere with his fitness to stand trial. Berkowitz's attorney, Mark Heller, entered an initial plea of innocent and announced that he intended to use insanity as a defense. He also questioned whether Son of Sam could ever receive a fair trial. I read internationally they compared this case to the case of Jack the Ripper. And I think that uh, there is a very serious doubt as to whether there can ever be a fair trial. The argument now centered on whether Berkowitz was fit to stand trial. One judge announced that he would refuse to accept a plea of guilty if Berkowitz continued to talk about demons, since this clearly marked him as insane. But Judge Joseph Corso took a different view and explained why he felt a trial should go I ahead. I found him fit to proceed now. What he was at the time of the commission of the crime, that would be the plea of insanity. I have made no ruling as to that. Son of Sam's arrival at court was spectacular. Fearful of public anger, the police brought him in a steel-plated prison van. New York's Supreme Court was cordoned off and there was a massive police presence. But in the event, David Berkowitz's appearance there was short. He pleaded guilty. The defense psychiatrist's opinion of insanity was accepted, and the demand for a full trial waived. Son of Sam was taken away to begin a sentence which altogether totaled 365 years.